All right, guys, number one. So there are only blue cubes, red cubes, and yellow cubes in a box. The table shows the probability of taking at random a blue cube from the box. Okay, so that's your probability table, guys. And our quantum statement, it says that the number of red cubes in the box is the same as the number of yellow cubes in the box. Complete the table. So what I will do, guys, is that I will label both red and yellow X, and we should know that all properties always add up to 1. So by default, summing all this up and making an equation and saying to 1 will give you that. Now what we could do is just rearrange to make 2x a subject, so subtract 0.2 across, and lastly guys, just smash 2 underneath, in other words, halving it, and you should get 0.4 for both red and yellow. And that's it guys, so that's pretty much 1a done. Now, let's move on to the next bit here, so uh, 1b. So there are 12 blue cubes in the box, and here they want us to work out the total number of cubes in the actual box. Okay, so let's switch, go back to the table. Now from here, we can see that property is 0.2 for blue. In other words, this is kind of telling us that 20% of all the uh, cubes must be blue. So in other words, 12 is equivalent to 20% of everything in the box. So let's go try and find 100%. That means 10% must be 6 if you half it. And then timesing it by 10, well, this means that a complete set must be 60. And that's it guys, is pretty much all you got to do. Alright, number 2. So D needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits, yeah? Now she also needs three times as much flour as sugar. So let's go form an equation, guys, yeah? So if you've got 50 grams sugar, that means three times 50 must give us 150 grams of uh, flour. Okay, cool. So that's one piece of info. And for the second, it's just two times as much butter as sugar. So two times 50 gives us 100 grams of butter. So I think these two are the most important things to have right now, yeah? So always try and note things down. Now for the next bit, Dean is going to make 60 biscuits and we need to work out the amount of flour she needs. Well, so far, we know how many sugar needs, is needed for 50 biscuits. So this means that 15 biscuits is equal to exactly 150 grams of flour. So this is kind of like directly equivalent. And we notice that 60 biscuits is just four times bigger. So four times 150 is 600 grams. Done. Now, Dean has to buy all the butter she needs to make 60 biscuits. She buys the butter in 250 grams packs. Now, how many packs of butter does Dean need to buy to make 60? Alright, so according to the information, we know previously she needed 100 grams of butter to make uh, 15 biscuits. So this means if 15 biscuits is equal to what, 150 grams of butter, then we can instantly say that to make 60, this is just literally 4 times um, as much. So 4 times 100 is just basically what, 400 grams guys, and that's it. So in, in, in essence, because each pack is 250 grams, she will need to buy two packs to make 500 grams, which will cover the 400 grams. So she needs two packs. That's it. All right, number three. So here we need to find the highest common factor of 72 and 90. Okay. So the trick of these ones, guys, is to always break these numbers using prime factor trees. So check it out. So what we could do with 72 is just break it down to 2 and 36. And then from 36, we can break it down further to two pairs of sixes. And lastly, breaking down each of the six, you get twos and threes. Now all you got to do is circle the last legs and then stick them together like this and then repeat the same for 90. So for 90 we can see we can break it down again by 2 and 45 and then 45 is in a 5 times table so 5 and 9 and 9 is just 3 times 3. Now let's go ahead and circle the last leg guys. So you should circle 2, 5, 3 and 3 and then just chain it together. So you got 2 times 3 squared because you got 2 of them times 5 and that's it. Now, for the highest common factor, guys, all you literally have to do is ask yourself, all right, what powers do both of these numbers have in common? So, for example, if you look at number two, they both have at least a single power of two. So, that means the highest common factor is two. As for threes, they both have at least two powers of three, so three squared. And for five, well, only a single one has five, so it doesn't count. That means your result is just two times three squared, which is 18, guys. And that's it. All right, number four. So it says here that the diagram shows the plan, front elevation, side elevation of a solid shape drawn on centimeter grid. Okay, so here's the plan, the front elevation and the side. Now in the space below, draw a sketch of the solid shape. Okay, so in this case, guys, we just have to draw a 3D representation of these diagrams, yeah? Now what I would personally do is firstly label the size, see the length. So what we have here is firstly a height of 5 and a width of 4 for both front and side. And we can see that the radius of the circle is just 2. So that's pretty right. 
So if you kind of think about it, from a 3D perspective, this kind of looks like a cylinder, in my opinion. Because you've got a circular base. If you look at it from the front, it's just something that stands up. And then you've got the side. So sketching the cylinder, it, it's going to look a bit like this, yeah? You've got your circular top. You've got your body. And um, what we can see is that we've got a radius of 2. And the vertical height is just, well, what? 5, yeah? So just for a second, let me just check the top for a second. Um, yep, so it's 5. And by the way, the 4 is trying to say, it's trying to represent the diameter, guys. Yeah, so 4 is the entire thing across. And that's it. That's pretty much the whole shape. All right, number 5, guys, yeah? So let's have a look. Now, shape A can be transformed to B by reflection in x-axis followed by translation of C and D. So just a quick note. A translation just means that you're moving it across by C and up by D. So just a straight-up shift. Now, what's happening here? So the reflection tells us is over here on the x-axis. So boom, that's our mirror line. And all we go do is more or less reflect that shape A. So the way I do it, guys, I just count how many blocks is away. In this case, it's two blocks away. And then I just ask myself, all right, if this two blocks from the x-axis on the above, it must be two below. So it should look a bit like that. The base and then the rest of the triangle should be exactly as you see it. Now, at this stage, we want to find out how far it's moved. So that's the vector of translation. So first we move horizontally. We can see that if we pick the top left corners of both shapes and we count the blocks, we find out that it's moved exactly six to the left and one down. And because we're moving against the x-axis, it will be a negative six. It will be a downward movement of negative one. And that's it, guys. That's literally all you need to do. All right, number six, guys. So a shop sells packs of black pens, packs of red pens, and even packs of green pens. Okay. Now, according to the statement, there are two pens in each pack of black pens. All right. There's also five pens in each pack of reds and even six pens in each pack of greens. Now, Monday tells us that the number of black pens sold versus reds versus greens were given by that ratio. In other words, seven represents the number of packs that were black, three represents the number of packs that were red sold, and four represents the number of packs that were green sold. And, and as per usual, guys, just add up the packs. We might even need it later. Now, just look at this question carefully. In the beginning, it said that two pens in each pack of black pens were sold. And we know that there were seven packs sold, so this means seven times two. And we do the same for the three and the four parts. We end up getting three times five and four times six. So doing the maths, you should get 14 for the first one, 15 for the second one, and 24 for the last one. And okay, so let's just keep that there for a second. So these are the number of pens that are actually sold as parts. Now for the next part, it says that a total of 212 pens were sold. Well, apparently, these 53 parts now should equal 212 pens sold. Okay, as the statement says here. Yeah? And they want us to work out the number of green pens sold. So 212 pens equals 53 parts. And as always, guys, for any type of ratio, always find one part. So to find one part, if we divide the first number by 53, and this is kind of hard for a calculator question, I'm not going to lie. We should recognize that it goes into exactly four times. If the math is a bit hard, just try and partition the fi that 53 as 50 and 3. And you'll notice that 4 times 50 is 200. 3 times 4 is 12. So it fits. Now, the rest of the math is easy. So you want to find the number of green pens. We know there was 24 green pens sold. So 24 times 4 must give us 96 pens actually sold. And that's it, guys. That's the question done. So here are two rectangles. So the first one is ABCD and the other one is PQRS. Now, according to the info, QR is 10. So label it 10. And BC equals PQ. So let's label PQ, I don't know, X. Meaning BC is X and the other similar ones are X2. All right. So just like that. Of course, if QR is 10 PS, let's call it 10 2. Now, according to the info, the perimeter is 26 for the first shape. So P equals 26. And that's the first one. Whereas for the second shape, the area is 45. So that's basically A equals 45. Now, what we can do is pretty much give expressions for these. Yeah? I'm going to go ahead and label A, B, Y. So DC is also Y. Meaning the perimeter of the first shape must therefore be what? Um, 2X plus 2y equals 26 okay so we just jot that down and in fact um, before we, we could even simplify that divide the whole thing by 2 x plus y is going to be 13 so that's kind of simplified it likewise for the area base times high is 45 so x times 10 which is essentially what 10x must equal 45 divided by 10 you should get x equals 4.5 that's it so we're actually almost done and by the way we're trying to find the length a b yeah so we just have to find the, the, the value of y. So plug in 4.5 to the first equation, rearrange to find for y. 
Well, 13 take away 4 is 9. Take away another 0.5, you get 8.5. That's it. Done. Alright, number 8. So, work out an estimate for that value. Alright, so typically for this question, guys, you should always try and round it to, I don't know, one significant figure. That's what I usually do. So, the one significant figure, you can see the first number is 60, second is 100. However, when you do it, you get root 600. And I'm not going to lie, I don't know how to do that. So, if you get kind of stuck here, it's always good to try something else. So what I will try is, let's try, I don't know, two significant figures, yeah? So let's try and round out two significant figures. Now doing so, you'll see that 63.5 is actually 2, two, two six figs, 64. Well, the second one is still 100. And yeah, we know what the root 64 is. Square root 64 times square root of 100 is just basically 8. And the second one is just 10. So that means you should get 80. Okay, B. So 2.3 to the power 6 equals 148. Now find the value of 0 0.23 to the power 6. Okay, so this one's actually quite easy if you see the trick. The trick is, if you look at 2.3 and 0 0.23, we can see that those numbers are 10 times apart. So this means if you're powering 1 by 6, that means the decimal place is also going to move instead of 1 place, but 6 places back. So this means that, that our final answer is actually going to be 0 0.000148. And that's it. And find the value of 5 to the negative 2. Okay, so the negative power means that it's a reciprocal. So instead of 5 to the minus 2, it be 1 over 5 to the power 2. And that's just 1 over 25. And that's it, guys. Now, moving along to number 9, they want us to work out that multiplication fraction problem. Okay, so with these kind of problems, my first tip is to always convert that mixed number into an improper single unit fraction. And the trick is, guys, is to always take that whole number 3, multiply against the bottom number 2, which is 6, and to add it to the top 1. To make it 3 times 2 plus 1 which is 7. So that's 7 over 2. And if you repeat for the second one, you got 1 times 5 which is 5. Add 3 which is 8. So you got 7 over 2 times 8 over 5. Now all we want to do here guys is literally just hit this head on here. So we're going to do what? 7 times 8. That's going to give us 56. And then we've got 2 times 5 which is 10. So almost done. So 56 over 10. Now we could simplify but let's go ahead and just switch up to mixed numbers here. Yeah? And we ask ourselves. How many times does 10 go into 56? Well, it goes 5 times, remain the 6. So in other words, it's 5 whole, and then you've got a 6 at the top over 10. And well, we know that 6 over 10 are both in the, in the 2 times table. So half and both, and you get 3 fifth, guys. And that's it. The graphs of equations 3y plus 2x equals half, and 2y minus 3x equals that fraction, have been drawn on the grid below. Okay, so it looks to me we've got two straight lines, and because both of the equations are linear, it has to look like that. And they're meeting at some point. Now, using the graphs, find estimates of the solutions of the simultaneous equations. When it says find estimates of a solution, all it means is that where do the two lines meet? So you don't have to do no fancy algebra of these equations. You just look at the graph and just say, okay, where is that intersection point? Well, it's right there. Isn't it? So all you guys have to do is literally um, zoom in a bit and just see what point that could be actually. So let's have a careful look up here. So my advice, guys, is just to do dotted lines across and um, and horizontally and vertically. And just looking at that, I mean, the top one looks a bit like 2.2, 2.3. Let's just say 2.3. Whereas on the left side, that's a three points down. Let's say minus 1.3. And that's it, guys. So we just jot those two values down. And we just write that as our solutions for x. So we could say, okay, x must be 2.3. Y must be minus 1.3. So a bus company recorded the ages in years of the people on coach A and the people on coach B. Here are the ages of the 23 people on coach A. Okay, so you're given a bunch of values in numerical order here. So the youngest being 41, the oldest being 79. And now it says that we need to complete the table below to show the information about the ages of the people on coach A. So to work out the median in this case, all we got to do is count how many people there are, which is 23, and always add 1. And then find the halfway value. So... In other words, we divide it by 2, because 2 is the medium. Now, the half finger, you should get the 12 person, and the 12 person should lie just about over here. So it's the, it's, so it's the person age 59. And that's it. Now, to find the low quartile, it's just like the median. Instead of finding the half person, you find the first quarter. So divided by 4. And well, 24 divided by 4 is 6. So we're looking at the 6 person. Once again, counting, you should get the 6 person to be 53 years old. Now, for the upper quartile, it's more or less the same as the lower quartile. In this case, you find the first quarter, then, but you times it by 3. Because the upper quartile is the third quarter of 24. Well, 3 quarters of 24 is just 6 times 3, which is 18. 
That's it. So we're looking forward to 18 person. Now, once again, you just count all the way. And since we know where the 6 and 12 person is going to be, you can just see that the 18 person has to be over here, which is age 66. All right, moving on. So here is some information about the ages of the people on coach B. Okay, so we've got the same kind of data, but this one's filled out. Now, Richard tells us that the people in A are younger than those on coach B. Is he correct? Well, to show that someone is younger, the coach A needs to have lower values than B. Well, look at the median, that's lower than B's. Lower quartile is lower, upper quartile is lower. And even the least age is lower as well. Actually, I didn't even check that properly. But yeah, um, in general, we can just say, yep. Since all statistics in coach A are lower than those in coach B, for example, the median is like the one we're dropping, 59 versus uh, 70. And from this, we can conclude that people in young A are actually younger than those in coach B. And that's it. Now for C, it says that Richard says that the people in coach A vary more in age than those in coach B. Now, what does this mean? What they're asking us here is to find um, the range of ages, yeah? So how for, who, are the, who are the youngest people and who are the oldest? Well, looking at coach A, we can see that the age vary by 38 years old because the difference between the highest and the lowest age. Whereas in coach B, it's actually 43. So in fact, according to the statement, we can say that, is this statement true? No, because the ages of the range of ages in A is actually lower than those in B. And that's it. And then you can put like some sort of like values. 38 is less than 43. And that should be enough, guys. So here are three spheres, P, Q, and R. It tells us that the volume of each sphere is 50% greater than the previous one. And then it wants to find the volume of sphere P as a fraction of, of the sphere R. Now, the way I'd personally do this, guys, I'd go ahead and label P as X, yeah? The volume of P is X, only because we need to kind of think about what's going on. Now, telling us each one is 50% more, so you can kind of think of it as, um, as a 50% increase, so 1.5 multiply. So, if the first one is X, that means the next year would be 1.5X, and then going from Q to R, it's going to be 1.5 times another 1.5. Well, we need to know that 15 times 15 is 225. So 1.5 times 1.5 is 2.25. I mean, there's various ways to do that, but that's one way we can do it. So therefore, we're going to have 2.25x. So that's pretty much the volume of R yeah, in terms of like that. Now, they want to find the volume of P as a fraction of R. Yeah? So in other words, we're going to have to divide the two volumes, P over R. So the volume of P over the volume of R is just basically what? We know the volume of P is x, and the volume of R is 2.25x. And that's it. This is our answer. But... But because they both got x, we could just cancel it out. So we'll be left with 1 over 2.25. And that's it, guys. Given that n can be any integer such that n is bigger than 1, prove that n squared minus n is never an odd number. Okay, so first thing what I want to do, guys, is always factorize the expression. So we're going to have something like n times n minus 1, yeah? Now, to prove that something is never odd, what we got to do is just more or less think of a number in our head. So let's do this, yeah? Okay, let's say n is, I don't know, some random odd number, yeah? Let's say it's like 1 or 3 or 5, etc. So if n is odd, we're going to have an odd number times, well, one number back is going to be an even number. So odd times even is odd. So here's an example. 3 times, I don't know, 2, that gives us a 6. So an odd times an even gives us an even, okay? So that's what's, that's what's essentially happening here. If you pick a number like 3, you're going 1 back, so it has to be 2. Now, suppose you want an even number for n, okay? So let's say if n is even, then this would mean that we're going to have an even number times an odd number. And well, we don't have to do nothing because even times odd is like the example above. When you times in two different things, you're always going to get an even number. So that's it. So actually, we just proved statement. We just proved that it can never be odd. And that's it, guys. 13 is done. Question 14. Find the exact value of tan 30 times sine 60. Give your answer in the simplest form. Alright guys, so to solve these kind of problems, we always go use our right angle triangles. And if you guys remember, we need to use something called the 30 and 60 triangles, yeah? Now, this is, these are just fixed definition. But what we need to know is that if we imagine that the, the length opposite 30 is 1, then we're going to have a length double it, 2. And if you use Pythagoras, you get root 3. Now, I'd personally just memorize this triangle because this is the triangle we need to learn. There's this one and also the 45-45, but we don't need it here. Now, to work this one out, we need to use Soccer Toa, all right? And we just have to basically pick the right one. So in this case, because we've got tan 30, we need to use Toa. And what that means is that we need to have tan of the angle, in other words, a tan 30. It's going to equal the O, which is opposite 30. Opposite 30 is a 1. And then the adjacent is next to 30, which is root 3. And that's it. Same thing for sine 60. 
sine 60 is so, yeah? So it'll be opposite the 60 angle, so it'll be root 3. So opposite 60 is root 3. And the hypotenuse is, well, is 2. So it'll be root 3 over 2. And that's it. Now, if you're going to multiply these together, what they want you to do is, not, is to actually multiply their fractions, yeah? So if you multiply the fractions, cancel the root 3, and you get a half. And we're done. Easy. All right, guys. Number 15 now, yeah? Hmm. So the diagram shows a solid shape, and the shape is a cone on top of a hemisphere. So guys, a hemisphere is just literally half a sphere, yeah? Okay. Now you give us some info, they give us the volume of a cone, and they give us the volume of a sphere. So because we've got a hemisphere, it's going to be half of that, yeah? Now according to the information, so just having a quick look at it, guys, yeah? We've got a radius of 3, because if the whole diameter is 6, it's half of it. And the height is 10. So and this is going to link to basically the info on the right. Now, going back to the info at the bottom, it says that the height of the cone is 10, diameter is 6, and hemisphere is 6. So basically stuff we already know. Now the important information here is that the total volume of the shape is k pi centimeter cubed, right? So if we had, if we had to work out the volume of both the shapes, the sum of it must be k pi. Okay, that's one thing to note. So just looking at the data, we can say that the total volume is literally going to be the volume of the cone plus the volume of the hemisphere. So what are, what are they both? Well, let's go back to the formula for a second, yeah? The volume of the cone is given at the top. It's a third pi r squared h, okay? So let, let's just pop that in, yeah? So volume of the cone is third pi r squared h. Now the volume of a hemisphere, as you remember, is half of that. So if it's four thirds pi r cubed, half of four thirds is two thirds. And that's it. So writing that down, yeah? So two over three pi r cubed equals k pi. Now, before we move on, let's try and simplify this, yeah? It says here that the cone is 10, the diameter is 6, and otherwise the radius is 3. If you drop these values in, and if we just knock out the pi's here, because look, we've got pi's everywhere. You can just you can just like remove it now. Now we just drop in the values. So just replacing r and h with what you know. So we've got a third, and then times what's that? 3 squared times 10 plus 2 thirds, and then r again is 3. So 3 to the power of 3 equals k. And now you guys can simplify how you want, but what I will do is just try and cancel all the threes. So you're left with 30 there. Cancel the 3 there, so it becomes 3 squared. And you get 2 times 9, which is 18. Just sum them up and you get 48. And that's it, guys. All right, 16. So we're given three dials on a combination lock. Now, each dial can be set to one of the numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. The three-digit number of 553 is one way the dials can be set, as shown in the diagram. Okay, so it looks like you've got three different ways to do five different numbers. Yep. Work out the number of different three-digit numbers that can be set for the combination lock. Okay, so what this is asking us is literally how many different ways we can arrange this, yeah? So for example, if you just had one digit, then if you only had one single dial, then you have five ways. But if you've got two dials, then you have five times five ways. Because you've got three ways, it's going to be five to the power three ways. Yep, so five times five times five, which is 125 ways. That's it, yeah? Now, for the follow-up one here, it says how many of the possible three-digit numbers have three different digits? So when they say different digits, what they're trying to say is that we can't repeat the numbers, yeah? So for example, we can choose numbers like 1, 2, 3, or we can choose numbers like 2, 3, 4, or even just like 3, 4, 5. However, we can't use the same number, yeah? So we can't use numbers like, I don't know, 2, 2, 3. That, that ain't allowed. So the number ways we can actually do this means that you initially have five numbers you can start with. Then you get one less, so times by four, and then one less again, and times it by three. So altogether, you have five times four times three ways, yep. Yeah? And that's it. And if you do it carefully, you should get 60. And that's it. All right, question 17. So given that x squared to 3x plus 5 equals 1 to 2, so what it's saying here is that x squared is equivalent to one part, and 3x plus 5 is equivalent to two parts, find the possible values of x. All right. So the best way to solve this question, guys, is to literally write down what we know, yeah? So we know from this statement that one part equals x squared, right? And two parts equals 3x plus 5. Now, how can we link these two together? Well, if we just look at the first one for a second, right? We can see that one part is x squared. How about we just double this for a second? Let's make it two parts, yeah? If we times this by 2, we're going to get two parts, which is 2x squared. Sounds logical. So in that sense, we can now say that these two parts must be the same because they're, they're part of the same ratio equation. So in a sense, if these two are the same, then that means they must equal each other. Perfect. Now, what we can do next is um, rewrite this as a quadratic equation because you've got your ax squared, you've got your bx, and you've got your c. So let's subtract 3x across, subtract 5, and just make it equal to 0. 
and then it becomes like that. And well, to solve a quadratic equation, just use a quadratic formula, guys. And the quadratic formula looks a bit like this, yeah? Honestly, guys, you don't have to bother factorizing. Well, when you have, like, coefficients bigger than, like, 1, like, 2, 3, 4 for the x squared, I just stick to the formula because it's quick and easy to do. So, looking at this formula, we just have to put in the right things. Well, the value of a represents the value from the x squared, so the 2. The value of b is minus 3, and the value of c is minus 5. So, if you substitute in carefully, it will look like that. Okay, so minus b becomes positive 3, and the b here becomes negative 3. You can see the a is 2 and the c is minus 5, and of course, the a at the bottom is 2. And now what I would do is just try and carefully like evaluate the certain side, yeah? So you can see here that minus 3 positive squared is a 9, and all of these values, 4 times 2 is 8, times a minus 5 gives us um, a minus 40, and because it's double minus, is a plus. So you get that value. 9 plus 40 gives us a um, square root of 49, which is 7. So updating that, you should get that. So you get 3 plus minus 7. Now, don't worry about the plus minus. All that means is that first you should add first. So for example, you do 3 plus 7, which is 10. And then 10 over 4 gives you 10 over 4. And simplifying that is 5 over 2. And if you subtract it, you can get 3 take away 7, which is a minus 4. So minus 4 over 4 is minus 1. And then that's what you actually get if you did it step by step. And that's it, guys. All right. Express root 3 plus root 12 in a form a root 3 where a is an integer. Okay, so essentially, guys, we just have to more or less rewrite root 12 into terms of root 3. And then add them together and then you got it. Well, the best way to do this is to just look at root 12 and then break it down using the prime factor tree. So, for example, when you take the 12, you can break it down into root 4 and root 3. And then if you break down root 4, you get root 2 and root 2. And then you just circle the last legs. And then when you have two sirs, two of the same sirs, they give you a whole. So root 2 and root 2 give you a whole 2. And then finally you get 2 and root 3, that gives you 2 root 3. So finally root 3 plus 2 root 3 is 3 lots of root 3s. And that's it. And now moving down to part B, we have to express that um, 1 over root 3 fraction to power 7 in the form of root B over C where b and c are integers. Okay, so straight off the bat, guys, all you have to do is basically stick the power 7 to both of those numbers. So 1 to power 7 and root 3 to the power of 7. And what this means now is that we're just going to multiply the same number itself 7 times. Well, 1 times itself is 1, whereas the root 3 would be root 3 times root 3 times root 3. I'm just going to use a dot so it doesn't look kind of messy. And you should get 7 of them. Now, all you guys have to do is to pretty much collect the root 3s, yeah? So for every two root threes, you get a whole three. So whole three, whole three, and a whole three. And then if you times together, three times three times three. Well, the first three times three itself is nine, and then nine times three is twenty-seven. Okay. And then finally, collect them all together. You do basically going to have one over twenty-seven root three. Okay. So we're almost done now. So this looks like kind of a question you've done before. So here we have to now rationalize it. And to do it, we have to times up and down by root three. Okay. So we're just trying to get rid of the third bomb. If you times up number root 3, you can get root 3 at the top. And on the bottom, you're going to get 27 times a whole 3. And well, 27 times 3 is just basically, what is it? 20 times 3 is 60. 7 times 3 is 21, so you get 81. So root 3 over 81. So given that x squared minus 6x plus 1 gives you all of that, find the value of a and the value of b. Okay, so if you notice that second part of the equation, you've got x minus a squared minus b. That's actually known as completing the square, so it's kind of like a, another type of quadratic. And well, you pretty much have to get that first part and make it look like the second half of the equation. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the first step you guys have to do for every single completing the square problem is to underline the first two terms. Okay, so x squared minus 6x. And then you're going to do a little square bracket and you're going to write x minus. And for the 6, you're going to half it and make it 3. So you, you can kind of think of it as like you're trying to make a whole square. And you've got 3 plus 3 is 6, so you always half it. And then what you do next is that you copy the plus 1, and you subtract it by the thing you squared, so it would be minus 3 squared. And then finally, just add 1 and minus 3 squared, so add 1 minus 9, you get minus 8. And then you're done, and you just copy what the a and b values are actually for. Now, for the part 2, it says, hence, write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph of what we just did. Well, the turning point is literally like your equation itself, okay? So it's always you always have to ask yourself, all right, when what is the lowest possible point of the graph or the highest point? In this case, is when you set x to three. You always look inside that bracket. If it's x minus three, that means the x turning point will be positive three. When you plug in a positive three, that whole bracket becomes zero, and you're left with 
y equals minus a. And that's it. Those are your coordinates of the turning point. All right, next question, guys. So number 20. So let's see. So h is inversely proportional to p. Okay, so you're doing proportionality. So proportional, you always use that kind of fish symbol, and you write 1 over p because it's inverse. And every time you use proportionality, we always replace that symbol with an equals k or equals something because it's a constant. Now for the next one, it says p is directly proportional to square root of t. So once again, you'd write in that form and then you replace the proportional sign with another constant, this time equals c. Because they're not the same constants, you know, they're two different statements. And we say, okay, where c and k are constant. So always go to like label what we have. Now for the next part, it says given that h is 10 and t is 144, when p is 6, find a formula for h in terms of t. Right, so looking at the first formula, we've got h and p, so we're interested in h is 10 and p is 6. Let's just pop that into that equation, yeah? So for the first one, we're going to have 10 equals k over 6, and then clear the fraction, multiply 6 across, you get k equals 60. So that's, that's our k found. Now for the second part, we use the t and the p value. Again, using the second equation, pop those values in. So you can have 6 equals c times the square root of 144. Well, square root of 144 is just 12. And then divide 12 across, you get 6 over 12 for c. And that means c equals half. And that's it, guys. So now we found the two values. Let's just go ahead and update our k and c yeah, by putting 60 and a half. So here comes the main part. Now we need to find a formula for h in terms of t. In other words, we need to combine the two. So combining the two formulas, let's write them down first. So we've got h equals 60 over p and p equals half root t. Okay. So it looks to me we can replace that p with the equation of half root t. So substituting that back in, you, you get something like this. Now, 60 divided by half. That's the same as saying, um, what, 60 times 2, okay? And that gives us 120. Then we have 120 root t. And that's it, guys. All right. The functions f and g are such that, and you're given the definition of them. And here in part a, they want us to find f minus 1x. So that symbol f to the minus 1 is known as the inverse function f, okay? So to find the inverse function of f, what we have to do is, is use this kind of technique. And this is the technique. You always have to say, all right, let x equals, instead of fx, you're going to let it equal f of y. And what that means is that you replace all the x values in that function of f with y. So instead of 3x minus 1, we've got 3y minus 1. And then our equation is basically 3y minus 1 equals x. And you just got to rearrange it to find uh, y. So to do that, you add 1 across. So you get 3y equals x plus 1, divided by 3, and then voila, guys, that's your inverse done. And for the second bit, it says given that fgx equals 2 times gfx, show that you can get a quadratic equation. All right, so what I did, guys, I rewrote the f and g functions here just for conveniences. And now to find the first one, fgx, that actually, what that actually means is that we're going to substitute a gx function into the function of f, so g inside f. In other words, so instead of 3x minus 1, it will be 3 times the g function, take away 1. So that's what it looks like, 3 times your g function, take away 1. And yeah, now we just have to tidy it up. So expand it carefully, guys, and eventually you'll get 3x squared plus 11. Now let's repeat it for the other one. Let's try and find uh, two gfx. So let's just find gfx, actually. Yeah? So this one means that we're going to substitute f inside g. So instead of x squared plus 4, it'll be the function of f squared plus 4. So in other words, we've got 3x minus 1, all of that squared, plus 4. Okay. Now, just remember, you've got a square bracket here. Yeah? That means there's two of them. So it'd be 3x minus 1 times 3x minus 1. And then you plus it by 4. So expanding that double bracket carefully, guys, you've got 3x and 3x is 9x squared. Next one would be um, 3x times minus 1, so minus 3x. Then you get another minus 3x. And lastly, minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. And then write plus 4. And collecting like terms, well, you've got 9x squared. You've got two 3x's, so that's minus 6x. And then you've got plus 5. Right, now let's go back to the question. It says given that fgx equals 2 times gfx, we basically just need to form an equation then. So to form an equation, let's make that equation. So fg equals 2 times gf, all right? So let's copy our fg function first. So our fg was 3x squared plus 11, so okay? And now we're going to equal that to 2 times that gf function. So let's just double that whole equation, yeah? So you should get 18x squared minus 12x plus 10. Now, now, just remember what the question wanted. We need to show that quadratic. So let's make it all equal zero. Yeah? Let's throw 3x squared plus 11 to the other side. 
So subtract the other side, you should get your answer. You should get 15 x squared minus 12x is the same. And then 10 take away 11 is minus 1 equals 0. And yeah, this one's done too, guys. Yep, and here we go, guys. Our final question, number 22. So let's do this. So there are only R red counters and G green, G green counters in the back. All right, so that's basically saying we've got R and G. A count is taken at random from the back, and the property is 3 sevenths. So let's say the property you're getting green, so capital G is 3 sevenths. That's basically the same as, according to our bag, it's like taking the G out and you still got R plus G. So that's basically total. A total is R plus G, yeah? Now the counter goes is put back in the bag. Two more red counters and three more green counters are put in the bag. So in other words, you still got your original R, now you've got R plus 2, and you also got G plus 3. And the property that you've taken that counter, which is green, is 6 thirteenths. So probably taking the green again, based on the new information, well, it's going to be 6 out of 13, which is also equivalent to, well, G plus 3, because that's how many greens you got, over the total amount, which is R plus 2 and G plus 3. Okay, so just adding them up. And just let's just tidy up the bottom for a second. So you still got G plus 3 on the top, but on the bottom you got R plus G now, and you also got, what, 2 plus 3, which is plus 5. Okay, so that's cool so far. And... The question wants us to find the number of red counters and the number of green counters that were in the bag originally. Okay, so what you want to do here is you want to work this out simultaneously. So let's circle the two equations we got, yeah? 1 of 3 7, 1 of 6 13. So let's rewrite them below now. So we have 3 over 7 equals, what is it? Um, G over R plus G. And what we want to do here is clear the fraction. So let's multiply R plus G and 7 across. So what you're going to have is um, 3 times R plus G and 7 times G. So expanding the bracket, you should, have, you should have 3R plus 3G equals 7G. And let's just move 3G to the other side, and then you're going to have 3R equals 4G. So what we've done, we just more or less simplified the equation, right? Now, let's repeat the same for, this, for the second equation. So we've got 6 thirteenths equals G plus 3 over R plus G plus 5. Once again, cross multiply, so times 6 by the R plus G plus 5. And 13 by g plus 3. Okay, so it should look like that. Now, expanding both sides of the brackets, so you're going to have what? 6r plus 6g plus 30, and that's going to equal 13g plus, well, 13 times 3 is 39. Now, um, you can do this any way you like, but what I'm going to do is just probably move uh, the 6g and 30 across here, because you've got 6r on its own on the left. So, subtracting 6g across, you get 7g. 39 take away 30 is plus 9. Alright, so what we have here now, again, is two simultaneous pair of equations, right? So we need to think about how to deal with this. Now, what we could do is pretty much use probably the result at the top. We've got 3R equals 4G, and we've got 6R at the bottom. My advice is probably multiply the top one by 2, so then you get 6R equals 8G. So then you have two 6R equations. And what that means now, you can pretty much substitute the 6R of the first one, which equals 8G, into the second one. So replacing 6R of 8G, you basically have this. 8g equals 7g plus 9. Now subtract 7g across, guys, you get g equals 9. And that's it, you found your green. And for the last bit, just substitute this value of 9 into any equation. I'm picking the 6r plus 8g one, that easy one we had earlier. So plug in in 9, you get 6r equals 8 times 9, which is 72. Divide that by 6, guys, and you get 12 red counters. And yeah, that's it. And this is the end of the paper.